expected. How are you? I'm all good. Good. I mean, how was how was the trip? I've got plenty of these. <laughs> <laughs> God good. damn it! I mean, how is it how is it to pho photograph with the with these things? You get used to it. I mean, obviously, the criteria of the FIA is quite strict in the way they want to keep all the protocols. So we're in sort of a media bubble, mm -hmm. and teams are in their sort of F1 stroke paddock pit lane bubble. And um, obviously, what they've done is they've selected, obviously, four or five agencies that work for teams as well as working into the media. Um, what we've done is we've provided a pool service for mm -hmm. the people that can't be here. So... We're sort of providing 30 or 40 pictures a day. Um, so the protocol is when we arrive at the circuit, we park in the normal car park um, with the normal pass. We go through, a, um, obviously, a body check, heat temperature check. Um, obviously, they've got lots of sanitation stuff everywhere. We go into the media center. We have to wear our masks immediately as we arrive at the circuit um, pretty much all the time. And then the only time we can take them off is like, particularly now when I'm at my computer desk, I can take my mask off. But then when I'm walking around the media center, I have to put it back on. Oh, and then God. the other yeah, time yeah. is when you're eating. So we're lucky that the Austrian Grand Prix, you have to think that it's the perfect location to host the first few races, really. Mm -hmm. They're incredible people for putting it on, but they're very organized in the way they work. I mean, it's organized by Cam Security, who do all the security for Formula One anyway. So they're based there in Austria. So for them, it's the perfect scenario. They can look after people not coming into the circuit, i.e. keeping everyone away. And mm -hmm. then people in the track, they just abide by the rules of the FIA, really, and the FOM. So once I we're mean, in the circuit, we just wear the mask all the time because they were just worried that if you were on the circuit, you could be spotted on the TV cameras. With of, no course. So of course. They just, everyone wears the mask. That's the rule. All the marshals, they wore the masks. It's hey, just I mean Look, I mean, I saw those, yeah. those photographs of, yeah. of you uh, uh, in F1 Esports Virtual Melbourne, and I cracked up. I mean, that was like that, how that, much that, you were itching I, to go back. I just did that as a wind-up, really, for the other I time. know. It created it, a, massive, a massive amount of um, yeah. meat, but I, I just did it for a bit of fun. It up. was wonderful. I, I, I mean, like doing it to be a professional esports shooter. I was just doing of it for a bit. Of course. Of course. I mean, I, I, no, it, it was a beautiful shot. I had on. I had my pass. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the pass, the pass is still valid. So we're lucky that they, they, you know, the passes are still valid. We don't have to collect any new passes. These are, mm -hmm. I, I guess, the collector's items now. But of course, the, of course. I mean, even the tabard, the tabard is there was only twenty tabards given out. You know, mm -hmm. um, do you feel? Just, do you feel? I mean, this is definitely part of Formula One history, really, because I mean, yeah. the, the 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 this yeah. open up. This is the first time that there is no audience, really. I mean, it's I mean, very different from from Monza. Yeah, you, you know, got when, an incredible when, gift from, from the uh -huh. circuit. They, they gave us these posters. And then they said, um, this is a poster that commemorates the Grand Prix. Okay. Special um, it's got both, it's got both the races on it, and it's okay. um there's only a hundred made. And wow. they gave them out to the media. So it's a very limited edition poster, which is only given to the media as a gift from them at the end of the Grand Prix. Wow. And then you got a letter from them thanking you for being there. I mean, you just feel so privileged, but I just no, no. I mean, it's uh, but but it is yeah. it is that that type of a situation where the yeah. first Formula One without the audience. How how does it feel being without the audience? Really, I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, you watch the football and they've added the you've added the crowd noise. I mean, that's that's something that you do miss, and I, I do feel like for the drivers, um, you know, being down at the first corner for that second race was was. Mm -hmm. Incredible experience to be there. Dude, first of all, I was invited on the grid. So there was only three photographers on the grid. So oh, that wow. was quite a privileged thing. I was there also last at the last race to get the kneeling shot. And that was already preset. So they had that mark. They had the, sorry, the, the, it said end racism there. And they all knelt. And of course, well, six of them didn't. That's their own particular. But they wore the, everyone wore the T-shirt. That was the main thing. Yeah. Then they did the national anthem. So it's the same procedure for the second race, but they didn't have the kneeling. But they decided between them in, at the meeting of the drivers that they would do the kneeling again. That's mm -hmm. entirely up to them. They, now I guess Lewis is pushing that a bit more. And of course. some of the drivers did arrive quite late because they're all, you know, the, the grid presentation is 10 minutes later, so they're not doing the interviews like they used to. Mm -hmm. um, but they want to go to the toilet. I mean, generally they're going to the toilet. I know it sounds stupid, but they're all going to the toilet before the race starts. So of they course. get out of the car, speak to the engineer, then they go to the toilet. So... 
they've got to try and get back, put the t obviously put the T-shirt on and get back to the grid to do the kneeling shot or do or do the national anthem, whatever. So it, yeah, some of them it was a bit of a rush, I think. I don't know whether they were doing no, I mean, two I mean, on the toilet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the toilet is kind of like, I mean, like this is the first race of a couple of months. Everybody are nervous, you know, <laughs> like, more than ever. They so. want to they obviously, you know, they obviously drink a lot during the race and yeah. they want to make sure that, you know, of they're, course. they're in the most focused. It's more mm -hmm. about concentration and the focus. You know, they don't want to be thinking about going to the toilet while they're driving. <laughs> I know yeah, so. I mean, like, there's really no time for that. So, so I, this is actually a perfect start to the show. This is exactly the questions that I wanted to ask about the uh, about Austria, and and it, and it is perfect, really. Like, you know, thank you for for you know, like, letting me know how, how this felt like. I mean, I, I would I my chocolate bar as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> is that a present too? That's a present for my family. But yeah, I mean, I got some. I actually, I actually bought the Grand Prix posters as well. They had them downstairs in the Red Bull uh, shop. So mm -hmm. I went and bought the, the smaller posters um, for each Grand Prix because I thought this is something that we're never going to experience again, having two races back to back at the no. same view. I know we're going to have that Silverstone as well. Silverstone, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I just thought the posters will be a great memory for me to remember this. Oh, it's, this it's, bizarre situation, really, more than anything, and that's it's definitely part of the history. I mean, talking yeah. about history, like I, I kind of figured out when I was doing the research about, you know, like uh, Formula One photographers that almost every single one photographer has that kind of like start. And and I, I just want to touch the subject of, of of your father, who was a you know like enthusiast yeah. of Formula One. I mean, what was it like growing up with this kind of like? Uh, uh, you know, really enthusiast of, of, of motorsport racing, your father Maurice, obviously. Yeah, my, my, my parents were very different in what they did. My dad was an aircraft engineer, so he mm -hmm. built planes. Um, he was more involved in the seats of the plane. That was his job. But because okay. I think you're from that mo from that airplane industry, that's where they're actually where the drivers raced. <laughs> so if you think about Silverstone, it was, it was two runways that went across. And mm -hmm. then the pilots used to come back from the war and that's how they, they used to come back and they had they all had sports cars, whether it was an MG or whatever little sports car. And they used to go round the outer road of the, of the airfield. That eventually became a track. That's how that's how track started. Really. Started. Wow. So my father never did that, but he did have an MG. He had an MG TD and obviously two seats in the front and then like a bench seat at the back. So when we were very young. My yeah. older brother, six years older than me, we used to go. We used to, my mum used to say, "Get take take the kids." out for the weekend i don't want to see them <laughs> so take them to the races so okay. my, dad, my dad and his mates used to go to the races that that was the way it was and um i i went as a very young boy in the bench seat at the back there was no seat belts and my dad used to take us in his mg and then it was really i wasn't really interested as you could say in the motorsport i was just there because i was i was taking yeah, we're there, there. Uh, we yeah. used to buy the model we used to buy the model cars in the shop at the at alton park was our local track and then um, my dad really obviously loved taking photos. He was an amateur photographer, had a, yeah. had a, had a, a practica to start off with. And that was a really nice camera with single lens. You know, he could change mm -hmm. the lens, a couple of lenses. And he loved his photography. If you look at the old, my old dad's old pictures, he was taking them back in the 40s and 50s. You know, he, he took some uh, uh, seriously legendary photographs, really, now uh, when the time has yeah. passed. I mean, like, really... You yeah, know, yeah. It's, it's very interesting. So, then, I mean, he used to take mm -hmm. us to the races. He posed me next to loads of cars and drivers. And yeah, I like, saw quite a, quite a few autographs. And he's got a really beautiful picture of um, uh, Mike, uh, oh, I forgot the name of him, uh, Mike Hawthorne. He's got mm -hmm. an amazing picture from 57 of Mike Hawthorne. So, there was a big race at um, Alton Park called the Gold Cup. And that was where all the Formula One drivers came to this race, very famous race. And you had Hill, Clark, Rint, Surtees, all in those 60s Legends. and 70s, those yeah. races. So I, I was there as a young boy, you know, didn't really appreciate who was there. Of but course. It but was now. Different. So then I got, in fact, it's incredible because we're talking now about Alton Park. Somebody, somebody posted a picture <laughs> from Alton Park 34 years ago. Someone found a picture of me on the oh, grid. Wow. Can you believe that? It's just an incredible coincidence that we're talking about it now. That is but incredible. I, He's posted a picture on Facebook. I've downloaded it with his, hopefully with his permission. And um, yeah, it's in my, so here's the picture. I'll show it you on the screen. Oh, please send it to me. I will, I will yeah. show it in a post-production. Yeah, that is incredible. Enlargement. Here's, here's me. Um, this is me actually 
Obviously, 19, 1986 um, wow. at Oldham Park. That's my second year of doing uh, motorsport. So, yeah, it's an incredible coincidence there. So, Oldham Park was my local track. It had the Gold yeah. Cup. had pretty much all the races, Formula 3, touring cars. You had the big Formula 5000 there. You had sports cars. So, you, it was a great circuit. And it was a, it was a famous circuit, you know. It was yes. that one air, that wasn't an airfield circuit. That was a purpose built track. But um, and then then the time has passed, and we we I'm, I come to this, you know, like you were you're 18. There is your first race, and, <laughs> and, and then you, and I mean this is like I mean you're you're Mr. Crash really. Well, seven, no, seven, no, 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 not really. I mean, there, I mean, but but I mean, there are a couple of instances that it, 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 it's it's incredible. Senna yeah. Brundle crash right in front of you first time you're taking the photos i mean this these photographs are part of the history they're they're still yeah. shown around the world how, how did that feel like i mean my brother said to me my brother was senna's photographer so he he was working with senna in formula ford formula 4 2000 formula 3 and i was 18 then so i could get a pass but on those early years i couldn't take pictures so mm -hmm. i helped him in the dark room and could see the progress and then 18 i thought well if he's going to invite me, I'll go to a race and I'll take some pictures. But that was literally my first race taking pictures of, of motorsport. And I yeah. had my dad's camera. I had my Pratica. So it was a push button camera with the, so it's his famous camera from all those years and, and wind it on. And that's how my brother started with that camera. He progressed to a one with a motor drive. Sure. I had the leftovers, as you could say. But so Senna, the race started, this was, I think, lap two or three that Senna just dived down the inside. And I've literally got them side by side, first frame. Yeah. Then go, then go to wind it on, and then look back up. They're already crashed on top of each other. I've missed. I've missed the crash. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you know, come on. One of those things. <laughs> and then the next minute, I can see he's on top of him. They get out the car, and obviously, eventually, they, the race is stopped, and they come to the cars, and um, they're sort of walking around the car. So those are the shots that are quite famous because. I think Senna's got his hand on his head like that and Brundle's... Yes, 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 yes. And we could have easily landed on Brundle's head. I mean, it could have been I even know. worse than we thought. Oh, it could have been when horrible. Oh, yeah, it's quite an incredible set of features. And there's about four or five frames, all in black and white. Yes, 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 yes. I, I will show these these photographs definitely. Yeah. I mean, these are. I mean, I I I was scrolling through through your through your uh, Instagram. It's just like yeah. I mean, the history of, of Formula One is right that there. Was, yeah. I mean, that's eighty three. So I wasn't a professional then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's. That. I mean, it was literally from school. Then eighty four. So I I didn't I did the Formula Three. So then the other the other amazing thing was that my brother said, "Well, I'm going to a Grand Prix somewhere. I can't remember what he said. Can you go and cover Senna's test?" Of, of the Tolman. I was driving then. So he said, oh, Senna's running in the Tolman at Silverstone. C can you go to Silverstone and cover the test? And I thought, oh, God, I'm going to have to photograph a Formula One car for the first time. And it's oh, a bit, my God. It's a bit quicker, but it's Senna. And I didn't, re Senna at that point was wasn't a driver, but obviously he was yeah. going into Grand Prix car. So I've got the shots of him with Rory Byrne. I've got him on track. And they're a little bit loose in the frame, but they've got this sort of for me, it's sort of an ambience and a, and a growing sort of uh, photography type pictures that you're taking, one, one in the mirror. So I've seen it in a magazine that someone could take a picture of, of a driver's reflection in a mirror or something. Yes. So I got up really close and did one of these reflection shots. And then the other shots are action. I, I got managed to get on the court, on the inside of a corner and got him coming past quite slow shutter speed, actually. And when you look at those pictures, that's my first ever taking pictures of a Formula One car. And I think they're not that bad, really. I mean, color as well. And 100 mm -hmm. ISO, the cameras weren't brilliant. I'm taking one frame at a time. Oh, I mean, compared to today. <laughs> so really, That's when amazing. You that thing, it, it was great to be there and record. I think I was the only photographer. I think it was a TV crew from Globo Brazil was there. That but, is incredible. That is so absolutely was, incredible. Then I went, to the, I went to the McLaren test as well after the end of the year. And I went to Thruxton for the finale. Mm -hmm. So I've got, I've got Senna crossing the line. At Thruxton, when he won the won the Formula Three championship, and then we went to the party where his mum was there and his son, and was, she was crying, and of it's course, quite yeah. And then, and then, really, that was that was my end of my career in '83. And I, I then went, decided to go to college and learn about light and lighting and more, yeah. more the commercial side, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, how um, did that How did that help if 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 it helped at all with the with the F F one uh, uh, photography? That, that part of your life. I Sorry? worked in a camera shop as well. 
Yeah, I mean, well, bizarrely, I worked in a camera shop selling cameras and learned about what films were on the market and what cameras were on the market and how all the process went. That was a weekend job. And then I worked in, obviously did this college course, but the college course included being on placement. So I worked mm -hmm. in a lab, I actually looked at the process of how the film was processed and the printing, but then also worked in this studio in Manchester, which was, um, which was a still life studio, but did catalogs. It's called Kay's Catalog, and it was a huge. Mm. This studio was massive, and they had four photographers with massive uh, like room sets. So yeah. we would do curtains, kitchens, bathrooms. <laughs> but it was an experience. I mean, it was of incredible course. to learn about light. I learned about mm -hmm. decorating. I learned about mo dealing with models and things like that. You know, so it was my early, you know, I was 19 at that it's, point. It's and, a learning curve. Yeah. yeah, massive learning curve. And my brother then said, the end of that year, because I got took on as a, a pro in '84 to work in that um, to work in that uh, studio, and uh, I did a year there, learned a lot, not just from a photography side, but also as a person, because you're dealing with photography, you're dealing with clients, you're dealing with it was all five by four or ten by eight pictures. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. The process of doing polar. I found a Polaroid of me in hoovering the floor, <laughs> which I didn't realize. Oh, nice. found it, and I thought, where the hell is that from? It's from the bloody studio. He gave me the Polaroid. I just remembered now I found it, you know, so things like that. Anyway, 84, at the end of 84, Keith said, my brother, let's set up an agency together. Um, equal partners will we'll, we'll start an agency, which mm. is what I think you want. Southern, yes. Sutton Photographic, as it was then. Mm -hmm. So 85, I, I, I moved from Manchester down to Toaster, where we had an office. Well, it was a bedroom, literally. My, my office was the bedroom, believe yeah. it or not. Then we had a dark room in one of the bedrooms, and then Keith had his own bedroom. So that, that was the early start. We had one, one cabinet of material. Um, I, I, wanted to, yeah. I wanted to ask you about one, one, one particular case of processing the shot. Your first, your first ever uh, uh, F1 race was Silverstone. And you got some epic well, shots, it right? It, I mean, it, was, it was actually so, Brand Hatch, Brand Hatch 84. Right. So even though when I was at that um, studio, I did my first Grand Prix ah, in 84. But I'm referring to the to the sh to the shots of uh, Anthony Reed in Saab when. Oh yeah, <laughs> again. Again, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that, but I mean, what was it like? What was it like going home in the car? To process these 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 photographs because you know you have something really special. Yeah, I mean that that was really weird. That was practice or qualifying, and it's a bit like the Formula One qualifying we just had here. You know, it was pouring down with rain. Here I had to go out. Yeah, <laughs> but then yeah. it was only Formula Three. It was my first ever race as a prof as you professional, you sure. could say. But I was still learning. Um, but I was excited. I was really passionate about going out and just doing my job and seeing what I could do with, with a pro camera, you know, because I'd one with a motor drive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I literally went to the end of the straight, what, what is the club circuit? So you literally, they come down towards you and then turn. Then there was a gravel, well, not even a gravel, I think there was a gravel trap, but with, they had the the the, the, car, the fencing, what, what was the old mm -hmm. fencing type of thing, which was very dangerous because a lot of people got injured from the poles it in them. Uh, catch fencing. Sorry, I was thinking of the word. So I literally just went to this corner. It was close. And I was pouring down with rain. Like, what the hell I was doing there? But I was excited. And um, I just saw Anthony Reid locked his brakes. or don't know what he saw. But in the wet, he just went over the back and then just barrel rolled in front of me. So I just kept my finger on the button. I think uh, in those days, there was no autofocus. So you literally had to manually focus yourself. Focus, yeah. So you follow focus. You learned that again by more experience yeah, and taking more pictures than that. But this was my first race. Then. He then barrel rolled, landed in the gravel trap upside down, got out of the car, went back to the pits, and that was the sequence. But I was so excited. I then drove back to the office. What was that feeling like? I mean, like you don't know if you have it really. You, you, you're you hoping that you have it, yeah. but is it sharp? I mean, it just, like, that is incredible. Really like sharp, to be honest. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know one of them's going to be sharp somewhere, but actually they're all sharp. So then, no, I mean, it is incredible. In the tank, and then obviously uh, got the film out, washed it, and then squeegeed it. They looked like, right and went, wow, 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 wow. So that's my frame. No. And then decided then to do the print. So then I did, I think about 10 sets of prints, mm -hmm. and then 
The next day I went back to the track, just excited again, you know, just to, to give these out to the media, so magazines, the newspapers that were there, because it's the first race of the year, they're all there, even though it's only Formula 3. So um, I gave it to the to most of the newspapers, all the magazines we work for, and then you gave it in those days on speculation. So you never knew you got the pictures published. You wouldn't, you didn't know. So you didn't know whether you get the money back. It was all on spec, as you could say. So you gave them the pictures. You didn't know whether you're going to make any money. But because there were spectacular shots, I expected them to be used pretty much everywhere. But then on the Monday after the race had finished, the whole story of the weekend was that crash. For some reason, it was the Saab Reynard. It was the first time it had run before. Um, yeah, it, it was, was uh, that was your hello world. It was Daily Express, Daily Express newspaper, five pictures, which we have the picture, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't know sure where the negs are. <laughs> That's the other thing. I don't know where the negs are. Uh, but obviously now the archives with Motorsport Network, so they, they'll have to find it. But I've got that. I've obviously got the original publication of, of the Daily Express, which is the one that we've got scanned. Um, but it shows it, the sequence. It shows the story. And it, 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 it's, it's a great it's, moment. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. After all of these years doing this, I have an impossible question for you. Okay. I'm sorry. I know. Impossible I know. Question, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the impossible question is this. If you would, as a stylist, get to pick every single aspect of the photograph, you get to pick the weather, the car, the circuit, the corner, the, the, is it in pits? Is it in, in the, you know, is it the start of the race? What would construct a perfect Formula One shot for you? Or you get three of them. But I think, I what think would be people, I think what what you have to consider is that a lot of people go to racing or motorsport because they want to see one thing. Yeah. They want to see a crash normally. Yeah. So for me to be in the right place and get a crash or an incident where you've got something that's spectacular. I mean obviously I'm going to go on to the flying fin. That is Oh, it's it, that's it, it, it's a one in a million picture because when you look at how it was taken and there was another eight photographers next to me. Um, and I speak to one of them who was next to me called Terry Griffin, who's in America. And he says, I didn't get it, but I've got him landing, <laughs> but he hasn't got him in the air. You Too know? Late. So obviously Mika came into the corner. We were doing this pan shot against the, against the, uh, the fence. So mm -hmm. it's the curve and the fence. So it's at one twenty fifth of a second. So you're blurring the image as he, so he comes into the corner, he turns and then goes across the curb. And we were all doing the same shot. We're behind um, what is concrete wall, and behind us is an advertising hoarding. So we're, we're in quite a tight space, and there's eight of us in a row. I think it was eight of us. Anyway, we're doing this pan shot, and I just heard, for a split second, I heard a screech of a break. So I looked up at the moment where he's coming into the corner and then just kept my finger really on the button. There was no autofocus either. It was literally manual focus and just kept my finger on the button. I think I took three frames in total. So one where he's going up, one where he's in. So he come over the curb and he, one oh, where he's in the air, and then one where he landed. And as I've gone through, obviously, I'm still at 125th, which is a bloody slow shutter speed. That is super slow. Yeah. On a picture. Um, he then landed on the ground and went off. And we literally look, all looked at each other and went, did you get that? <laughs> you know, the usual stuff <laughs> from the photographer, you know, because we all want to know whether everybody else got it. They all kept quiet. Everyone kept quiet. And I said, I think I might have got it, but I'm not sure. And I didn't of say course. anything. Most people said, no, I didn't get it. One guy next to me called Pascal Rondeau, who's quite mm -hmm. a famous French photographer, he was shooting at a 60th. He didn't get it. No, there's and then no way. people started to admit, no, I, I didn't even see it. <laughs> I mean, some no, people, no, no. I don't is... think even the TV got it. But there was, I've seen one picture from above. So there was mm -hmm. a hospitality unit above us because you can do the shot looking down the street. Yeah. It's quite yeah, a famous yeah. So somebody from the agency that I work with now, they, they got it from above, but it doesn't show any height. It just yeah, shows... that, I mean, that, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the <laughs> worst, worst possible yeah, 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 angle for that particular shot. Yeah. Uh, what, so what, did, what, what did Mika has say, about, say about that shot? You must have well, talked to him. Yeah, the process then went, so we, we, we processed all the films locally in a local lab. So then all the films went in, so it's color film, all went in for process. This is 93 in Adelaide. Um, all the films go in for process and come back the next morning. So the next morning, we're looking on the light box, film after film. And then we come to this. My brother's looking on the light box and he goes, oh, my bloody God, that's incredible. You know, on the light box. And everyone comes over. Me in particular, <laughs> want to see what it is, what I've got. And I'm sort of smiling a little bit, but I'm not I don't want to boast too much. 
That is incredible. It's the sharpest picture. He looks at the first one. That's okay. Second one is the, is the one where he's in the air. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. Found, I found the one where he's hitting the ground, and it's sort of like that with the with the with the back end. That's okay as well. And he says, "Wow, that's incredible. We need to get that printed." So he cuts the three frames out. The lab is still there, so we say to the lab, "Can we have fifty duplicates of that frame, the, the the one that's the sharpest? And can you do us three prints?" So literally, they go away. They come back, and about an hour later, an hour, one or two hours later, after the first session. So in between the sessions, I've then got the print. And it looks absolutely incredible. Oh, yeah. And I mean, that, that photograph I've is... I've got to show Mika. So I say, I say to the lab, give me the three prints and we'll go and show Mika. So we go to Mika and he goes, no, that's not me. <laughs> he says, <laughs> I said, that's you. And then the next minute, he goes, that's just crazy. I said, is that really what happened? He didn't understand what happened. All he cared about was, was the car okay, you know. And But he didn't realise he got that height. Because when you're right. in the car... You don't feel anything. You just feel the impact when you hit the ground. You know, and he, he said he damaged, the front, he damaged the front wing, which I didn't know about until a few years ago, he told me. And then um, he literally says, um, I want a print. I says, well, here you go. This one's yours. I said, yeah. can you sign the other two? He says, yeah, I'll sign them. So then comes in the flying fin. He signs it, the flying fin, Mika Hakkinen. My and, God. And, and that's the print I found last before I left for Austria. I saw it. I it in my wardrobe. I didn't know where it was. I knew I had it. So that print I found the other day with 93 on it. So that's crazy that I found it. He then said to the engine, he showed it to the engineers and they said, wow, because we, we knew there was a blip on the telemetry and we didn't know what it was. The TV didn't capture it. We never saw it. That's the reason why there was the blip on the telemetry and we don't know why. And that's oh, the reason why you damaged your front wing, you know, so it all came into place. Then obviously that picture just got published everywhere. I think we did like 500 prints for McLaren. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, this this is a, this is a one of the one of the you know. The, the next funny story is the next year was '94. We we put a pitch into um, to Rothmans and through an agency, and there's my picture. Rothmans pitch. We want to capture this picture. <laughs> with the Rothmans Williams car and um, using my picture in the pitch for the advertising agency. This is the picture we want of him going over the curb because they don't realise that is a one a million picture and that you're not going to capture that necessarily of that car in that place. At oh, that my time. God. With that shutter speed, that exposure. You know what I mean? It, no, that this is this is where everything comes together yeah. in this. Uh, I don't know, like some that's, sort of. And if you think about it, I, I, you can probably feel the passion, but that's why I'm a motorsport photographer, because of that passion. Not only because of that memory. I mean, I've not taken a picture necessarily like that again, but I've taken many more that, of, that uh, I know in my, my mind that are, are memorable pictures. But that one in particular, you know, it's my second year in Formula One doing all the races. It, it, it sort of it's cements, incredible. It cements your career. And it gives you appreciation from not only the photographers and media, but the drivers, the teams, everybody that's in Formula One, you know, so. It, yeah, it's I, a mean, great absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, pictures like that really put put the photographers on the map. It has to be spectacular. Yeah. I don't know. I, I heard some, somewhere uh, like somebody almost has to die to get famous, you know, like in, the, in oh, yeah. this kind of uh, it's a weird thing. But I mean, of course, I mean, these are yeah. these are, you know, like I mean, you said, I one in a million pinch the last, pictures. Yeah. I mean, the last three years I've, I've been working on some charity projects, which I've been really happy to do because I'm, I'm in the sport. I feel like I want to give something back a little bit. I'm in a privileged place. And so for the last three years, I've been doing this charity. I've always been doing charity stuff, but especially with Great Ormond Street Hospital mm -hmm. in England. I've been doing a collection with the star cards and getting the full, you know, the full grid picture signed. But then I thought, let's try and do a, it happened all of a sudden because I got the Lewis picture with the trophy. Mm -hmm. So basically I'm, I'm, I'm above in Montreal shooting the podium and Lewis right at the end, it's literally all the other photographers left. I carried on shooting. And literally as he comes around to go off the podium, he's lifted the trophy and it goes, it, it hit the light for one frame, literally, and it hit the light. And I, I look back at it on the, on the camera to send it. And wow, that's incredible. And then I went to Toronto. Lewis then used that picture on Instagram and Formula One used it. And mm -hmm. then I, we've got to do something with this picture to make, charities I, I, yes. I, 
Parity was immediately in my mind. And he'd gone to Toronto. So I was in Toronto and I knew his guy spins beats, the guy that works with him on his a lot of his sort of um, social media stuff. And I said um, to spins, I said, would, would Lewis be happy to sign some of them for charity? Because I know he's used the picture. He likes the picture on Instagram and Formula One used it. And he said, yeah, he'd love to help you out. So I then got some prints made in Toronto in the local quick fix shop or whatever. And we took them to his hotel where Lewis was staying. And he signed, mm -hmm. said, you can have five and I'll have five. You do your charities. I'll do mine. And then send, you know, sign one to me personally. So um, I then got back the envelope. We went to pick it up from the hotel. Lewis didn't come down, but. He was busy doing stuff, training, whatever. Obviously. And then Spins, Spins brought them down and he said, look, Lewis doesn't really want to use this picture for charity. So he's giving you all the 10 back. So you can do 10 charities. It's oh, brilliant. That's amazing. So that's what we did. We, we I numbered them. I, I signed them myself and they all went to charity. So it's great. Then the next year was the belly flop moment. So it, it was one moment always each year that you think in your mind. Belly flop uh, was crazy. I mean, like that, that, that is a crazy, <laughs> crazy timing. I have I, I have I, I have tried many, many belly belly flop shots, but that one is perfect. I mean I, that I, I mean <laughs> yeah. I didn't know the story. So I only got told the story this year. Someone sent me the video clip of them talking in the press conference. So Louis said says to Daniel, So what we're gonna do, we, we, I've got to go to the pool. He says, you know, it's 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 sort of history, it's yes. You do it every year, you know. Weber did it, Vettel did it, whatever. And he says, uh, "Why don't you just?" Why don't... So Lewis says to Daniel, "Why don't you do a belly flop?" And he goes, well, "What's that?" He says, "Well, you go in the pool and you go like that." <laughs> so I thought I didn't know anything about this because I'm I'm already at the pool. I'm already waiting at the pool in my position in the middle, and um, I'm with the Getty photographer, so I know that I'm going to get some good shots of him looking at me or whatever he wants to do. I don't know what he's going to do, and he turns up and he literally we do the team shot. And then he just goes on the edge and I'm thinking he's going to, he's going to dive, you know, but no, nope. he literally goes nope. like that belly flop. So I then look back through the frames and there's one in particular where he's just, Oh, I know. I, I know that. Right. I'm thinking that's, that's, a, and you look at who's in the picture, there's Horner, there's Adrian Newey, there's all the team and they're all smiling and laughing. It's a great picture. And then you've also got the media, which is part of the picture. It, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Perfect. <clears throat> Perfect. That, 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 that was, a, that's, that that's was my a beautiful picture one. charity again. So I, I, I literally go to, I think it was the German Grand Prix with the prints and say to Daniel, I said, look, would you mind signing these for charity? I said, I only need five because I thought five's plenty and then sign one to me. And I'm thinking, oh, I'll, I'll put something special on it. I said, really? Okay. So I, I don't look at it. I don't watch him. I just, you know, let him do his thing in the, in the bit. And then he mm -hmm. signs it. Hey, Mark, belly flop. So I'm thinking... <laughs> And then I don't know really why he's done belly flop, but then it, it only really clicked to me this year that somebody sent the video clip. Yeah, yeah, so that, yeah, that, that's incredible. Charity, let's go to charity again. And, and then, so it's now a tradition to sort of get this going. So last year, um, as you probably know, um, I hadn't really got something spectacular, but then Max um, in Germany was was sparking at the first corner. Coming oh, yeah, that is a great shot. That, that picture was an incredible 20th of a second. The sparks are just crazy. Um, but that's his lap. He only came second, actually, in qualifying. But I, mm -hmm. I thought that's the picture. That's perfect picture. That will work really well because Max won the race. But I didn't realize that when he came, because I, I went to turn three, I think it was, and nothing happened. And even though it was the, it was, it was the craziest race of the whole year, but not for me, because <laughs> I, I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I wasn't at turn. The last turn was where everybody went off. And I didn't get anything. So I went to the pit wall to do the finish with the flag because I've got pit wall access. And um, I just kept my finger on the button. So as he crosses the line, I've got the, I've got the flag, 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 flag. And then all of a sudden in the background, bang, with the fireworks. And I didn't even know. They never told us. But luckily, I've got it in the frame. And I didn't, again, I look back. Wow, that's amazing. And I, I, I send that one. That has created the biggest Instagram likes for me it was six and a half thousand which is pretty big for me and and yeah. um that's the picture i said which one we're going to choose i've got that one and i've got the spark but i'll do both so i did then did both so i went to see max in hungary this time last year and uh he he thankfully signed them all and we got so far we got 10 again we could have got five of the spark and we've got five yeah. of the five so i'm thinking what picture it's is going to be this year. 
It's going to happen your, some time or other. <laughs> what is your favorite favorite weather conditions to photograph in? I mean, like, you know, what are, what, are, what is the favorite of, of all? Like, rain? Yeah, I mean, for rain, rain can be spectacular because of the rooster yeah. tail. Because, you know, you've got these balls of, of spray at the back. But I think the most spectacular is when you've just had a massive downpour and the mm. sun comes out. So oh, yeah, got, yeah, yeah. Not necessarily a rainbow, but you've got the sunlight against the rain. And it creates it creates incredible pictures under incredible light, and that can be. We're always looking for backlight or light on the car, or low light or sunset, or we're always looking for something a bit more different to to showcase. Like Abu Dhabi, when we go to Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. we've got the ball almost in the background at five thirty. There's no other race really like that. Bahrain, it just doesn't have enough. The light's already gone. It's it's never the right time. You, mm -hmm. It's an old place. So it's it, it's in the thing about Bahrain. It's then about the sparks, really, or shooting against the palm tree lights that they put in, or you know, you, you look at each track and they create and their the, variables. Yeah, yeah, they create the. I guess they create the photographs for you, but you do have to go and find the pictures. Of course, so we always go on a new track we would always go on a wednesday and do a recce of the circuit just for the photography not even for the drivers really more about learning the track so like in when we've gone to vietnam we'd have gone a day early every track new track we always go a day early and if yeah. i work i mean i worked on the track in abu dhabi I, I actually did the building photography of the track so i saw it from a desert island to grow into that incredible facility you know so for me that was an incredible project and then course, to go back course, every year and still work for the same, I work for the government. Uh, so um, to work with them on all the pictures and do the helicopter shoot, and it's it's a crazy, helicopters are amazing. I, I'm scared of heights, believe it or not, but I go in a helicopter. <laughs> well, How I mean, about, it's, it's, I know, a shot. it's a shot. It's a shot, it's worth it. I mean, like, you gotta do it. I, I go at 5,000 feet in a helicopter. Yeah. With the door open, shooting down as they do the fly pass. That is an incredible picture. But it is scary. I must admit, oh. you've got you've got a seatbelt and harness on, but you do feel a little bit hesitant, and it's moving around a little bit at that height, oh, and it's for cold. Sure, for even sure. though like thirty degrees downstairs, it's not that upstairs um, in the helicopter. But it's 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 great fun. I mean, that's the, the the nice things again about my job. You know, people spot me in the helicopter. It's become a tradition where they spot me in the helicopter and shoot me and send it send it to me on Instagram or or Facebook and that's and funny. I'm joking used to being in a helicopter but i shouldn't be because it's a police one <laughs> it's almost like a, it's a military helicopter a police stroke police helicopter so it's it's sort of top secret but um i'm doing it for the government but um it's it's an incredible experience to do this job you know things like that are great what is your favorite place in the my favorite moment obviously of every race is a start what, what, yeah. is, do you have a, a favorite favorite moment i i Moments I, are difficult to explain. I mean, obviously, like to, like in these races, I'd say the start is great, but there's not been a crash at the first corner for a long time. I think they're very, they're very hesitant. It tends to be at the top, as you know, at turn three, turn four, mm -hmm. because they, they've got that run up to the top there. And they, they know that if they crash at one, <laughs> the race is over for no reason. When you've got a good run up to two, you may as well wait, be patient do the slipstream into two. You know what I mean? So you have to think the mentality that way. I obviously did the start for the first Grand Prix there at turn two. Nothing really happened. Obviously, the two mm -hmm. Ferraris crashed. I wasn't there. But um, <clears throat> you have to think that each track is so different. So we're going to come here to Hungary. Again, there's not really been many spectacular crashes here at two. Sometimes it's more at three or going up the hill or at the chicane. You know, so Hungary, again, is a very short track, very quick track. Um, I, I mean, I love I love Monaco as a circuit to, for taking pictures. It's probably my favourite because we've got yeah. to be we're, we're so close to the cars. You know, you're touching them in most places. Um, it's still got the spectacular backgrounds. It's still got the yachts. Right. It's still got the buildings. It's it's glamorous. It's and at night the actual circuit opens up. There's no there's no um, they take all the barrier most some of the barriers away and it opens mm -hmm. up a normal road you know so people can walk the track where, where the drivers have just been the top you know the tire marks are exactly where they were when the when the cars were running so you've got that spectacular side of it there's the parties the rascas is crazy now rascas literally opens up to a club there's about six or seven clubs that run into rascas corner on the track it, it's bonkers it's literally bonkers you can't get through now because the security at either end you check of your course. bags 
can't take cameras in there, things like that. So it's changed a lot, but it's still, for me, the, my favourite track. Um, I love going back there. I'm going to miss it this year. But, um, what, was the, what was the excitement about uh, 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 Singapore race? Because, I mean, that was about to be yeah. the first night race. I mean, everybody were talking about it. Uh, I, I, I know a little bit about it, but... Uh, I think for me there is that the people create the race there because you can hear them. Mm. I mean, obviously, new era of, of, of the turbo and the hybrid. They're obviously, the, the noise of the engine is dampened down by the... They have to regenerate. The, they're not going to let the energy out because obviously that's to recharge the battery. So there's less noise coming out of the car. So this in this era, you do hear the crowd more. And there, they're almost screaming. It, it's incredible. It's it's totally different than any other track. And they are close to the circuit. Yeah, I mean, there is yeah. a track like that, but not at night. And obviously, you've got the humidity. They're all... It's funny when you see the mechanics go on the grid, they've got these coolers that go in the car, but they, they cool the mechanics, you know, with them before the drivers arrive, things like that. And and it's, I guess, it's spectacular because of the sparks again. And it's spectacular because you can hear them more. You can literally hear the whole track. You know, you hear them going around the whole circuit. Of and course. you can hear the people. The, the people are so enthusiastic there. Um, it's their one and only race of the whole year because it's a street track. And they really do get into that party atmosphere. Oh, they're super, super enthusiastic really, about it. That's for sure. About, I think it's about seven and a half to eight thousand people that are in Paddock Club. It's the most. It brings in the most revenue, I think, for the whole of the Grand Prix. That and Abu Dhabi are the biggest races in terms of revenue turnover for hospitality. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just to give you an idea. I'm obviously Singapore as a country is quite a wealthy country, and people do pay for those packages. But there oh, is still people outside the. And there's a lot of expats there. There's a mix of people coming in from Asia. It's one. Of, it's I think from Asia point of view, it, it's one of the most spectacular races that brings in people from around the world. I think that's hundred percent. That's, that's I mean, Singapore is a, is, a, is an amazing hub uh, for yeah. for both Asia, well actually for for the whole world. So no wonder, and it is a super wealthy country. So uh, you know, like put that together, night Formula I One. I mean, of course. Yeah. I think shooting under those lights is quite spectacular as well. You know. Varying, you, you see a lot of pictures shot with slow shutter speed to get the blur, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like the light blur, or, or the, the panning, yeah. You can add a filter that brings out the light twinkles, you know, things like that. There's reflections, there's, there's lots of different shots you can shoot. And then you've got the sweat of the drivers because it's so humid. Oh, it's, they tend to be wearing towels, drinking more. You know, you've got all these so different little pictures details. in the paddock, you know. So you've got to think, it's not just also about the action Formula One, being a Formula One photographer, it's also about the drivers, the team principals, the trainers, the the, the, the catering, what's, what's going on also around the paddock area or in the pit lane, you know. So for me, obviously it's difficult now with the COVID, we're not allowed in the pit lane or on the paddock, but we've got photographers that are, that are entwined within the team, so they, mm -hmm. they're providing those pictures. So but I feel a little bit frustrated that I can't do that. But So the only time I see the driver at the moment is in Park Fermi um, for the, the qualifying or the race. So when you, when I know obviously I was on the grid, that was a great opportunity on the grid here to do that. Yeah, it was um, amazing, yeah. Drivers, um, whether it's portraits or the team, I got quite a lot of the team principals walking through the main door. Um, some of them were waving, you know, at us. you know, there was only three of us there. So um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it was great. Um, I mean, I feel I feel very privileged to to be doing what I'm doing, and I've, I've got a huge. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, I want to. I, I, there are two names: Alex Albon and yeah. uh, Jensen Button. Sure. I mean, Alex Albon, you photographed in 2008, 2009. He was a baby. I mean, Jensen Button, Sutton Agency was actually supporting his career, like after karting, and I mean, from that moment to the crazy eyes. I mean, I mean, watching was, watching yeah. somebody f to sure, go sure. from here to yeah. win a championship, and you have a relationship with him for sure. I mean, it uh, was crazy. It, it changed a little bit because obviously Jensen, obviously in Formula Ford was when we sponsored the car. Mm -hmm. he, he had he had two backers that were his managers who put the money in to support him in Formula Ford. Um, he come from karting, British karting champion. I don't think he was world champion. I think he was second or third. Um, anyway, um, he, he then became into Formula Ford. He had Jensen racing on the car mm -hmm. and his manager came to us. Harold Heisman was the guy who came to us. And actually we knew Harold from Formula 3 as well, was a good friend of ours from a Norwegian driver. He came to us and said, look, we've got no budget for for, um, for 
photography or uh, promotion like PR, but we, we've got lots of space on the car. But literally, we've got an empty car. So could we do a deal where we put your name on the car and you provide the pictures? It's great for you because you'll have your name on there so you can send them out. And then we were a bit hesitant because we didn't, you didn't know if someone, the only, the only time it's going to benefit you is if he wins. Yeah. Because if you put the pictures out, no one cares. But if he starts winning, it's a different story. So that first race, we, we, we obviously stickered up the car, full, full livery, the overalls as well. And then he started winning race after race after race, became champion. So we pushed those pictures out to the media as he wanted, but we pushed them out with our name on the car. So it like it worked. It's it, although it's free publicity, it, it worked in our favour. The national newspapers, the the Formula One teams got all these pictures, and eventually Jensen, you know, obviously went to Williams. But in Formula Three, he had a full budget. It meant that he was the top driver. He had the FINA sponsorship, Marlboro. He had the Renault uh, chass- uh, Renault engine, sorry, and and full budget. And we got him a PlayStation hat deal as well. Um, so Sutton then just became a patch, but it didn't matter. We were getting paid then. And then obviously he went to Williams. We went to that first Williams uh, test. At, I think it was Barcelona where they had the, the battle between him and a couple of other drivers. He won that, then became Williams driver. And then really our path sort of disappeared a little bit. We saw him and knew he, he appreciated what we'd done because obviously those pictures will be there forever. But he didn't then win his first race till 2006 at mm-hmm. Hungary. And um, I remember that picture. I've still got it. And it, it's crazy. What I call crazy eyes because He's going like that. I think he's going like that in the car to, to, the, to the team people that are waiting in Park Ferme. He's going like that. And he's got the helmet on. He's crazy eyes. He's just, you can see the emotion. Although he's got, got his helmet off, you can still see in his eyes. It's crazy. And I thought that's an amazing picture. Obviously, he won that race. We did all the pictures. And then when he went to Braun, obviously, you had that incredible car that had the double diffuser and was just revolutionary. And it just won, won, won. Um, and then we got to Brazil, and obviously that was the clincher for the championship. Jensen obviously didn't win the race, but um, <laughs> got enough points to win the championship. And then Maybe. I'm in Park Ferme with him. I'm running with him in Park Ferme. I don't feel like I've got any pictures of him at all. I've got him hugging his his trainer, um, Mickey Muscles, whatever he's called. And that was the nice picture. But I think I've seen some pictures of me running with, with Jensen into Park Ferme. And I think Massa won that race. And... Um, but Jensen won the championship. And then we're in Park Ferme. I'm right at the front. I threw my, um, I had both cameras on me. <clears throat> and the funny story there is that um, I dropped one of my lenses, the 16 to 35 lens. I dropped it the day before on the floor and smashed it to come with me the reeds. And luckily, a Brazilian photographer, Beto, had another lens for me. He said, I can lend you this lens for, the, for tomorrow and the race and everything. And it was a 10 to 6 to 14 millimeter. 10 millimeter to 40, so really wide. So originally you like that. Now I've yep. become, and I didn't, I didn't make anything of it. I just thought, and it was a Sigma lens. I didn't really know whether it was any good or not, whether yeah. it was sharp. And then the next minute, Jensen was shouting, Jensen, get your helmet off, get your helmet off. I think there was a bit of swearing going on. You probably hear it on the TV. Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> then he then takes his helmet off. He then sort of comes over to me in particular because he could hear me and saw me. And then goes like that, right in front of my lens, my 10 millimeter at that Damn, point. And he's perfect, really like perfect. Bigger. And without the 10 millimeter, I wouldn't have got it. So he's gone no like way. that. And he's gone like that. And he's gone like that, but with the crazy eyes. And then obviously, I then give my, I give in those days, 2009, we, we had an editor. So I give him the card, said there's some nice pictures on there, agents, and get those out to the newspapers. So those go out to the newspapers. We then fly back that night from Brazil. We did all the team celebrations. That was crazy. We did fly back that night back to England. And we're with all the Getty photographers. The Getty Images, you know, obviously biggest agency in the world. We go to, the, they, 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 they literally get off the fly. And there's a the news agents literally there as you come off the fly into the terminal. And they're, they're running there, you know, to get, to look at, to see where their pictures are in the papers. And they go, oh, that's not mine. That's that's Sutton. That's Sutton. That's Sutton. <laughs> and they go through every newspaper and they're all my pictures because mine are my spectacular. So, guys, did you get any pictures in the paper? Oh, no. no. It looks like you've got them all marked. <laughs> so then I, I bought all the copies of the newspapers. I then I heard. got the front cover of Autosport. Um, but the Autosport one was quite clever. I then go to Abu Dhabi. There's actually one more race left in Abu Dhabi. Mm-hmm. And um, we go to Abu Dhabi and I want Jensen to sign these. And I go up to him and say, uh, Jensen, would you sign these? And he goes, 
He went, my eyes look crazy. I said, Jensen, don't you remember 2006? And don't you understand that you just won the world championship? And it doesn't matter whether your eyes are crazy or not. You are showing emotion. That, that's why the newspapers use them. That emotion is why you're in the paper, why you're in Autosport front cover, you know. So for me to get that signed again was, was my memory, you know, but also memories that I will never forget, that's you know, amazing. the story and the stories, you know, that go with it. You know, it's great. It's great. Um, great emotions. Uh, I would like to talk about one one particular driver, like all old school. Uh, I heard somewhere that Jackie Stewart is 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 your personal favorite, and uh, really, I knew Jackie Stewart obviously, but I yeah. then I went and and research, and I am such a fan. After like you 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 watch this this man for like two minutes, you, you just fall in love. Uh, he's, a legend. he's incredible. Yeah, he's a legend. Uh, it's great. It's great that some of the drivers do say stay in the sport, you know, and either become commentators or or work with mm -hmm. other drivers or work with teams you know it's it's great that they're still involved because they have so much history but also you know they're very clever people and even though they don't know the technology necessarily um jackie's of, of a different era but they still have a lot to give to the sport and he, he's three times world champion you know i mean obviously i was a very young boy when when he was winning those championships but um he sticks in my mind as being just the legend of legend. He's actually the oldest world champion still alive now. I don't know if you know that, but um, for me, it's his signature. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen it. I mean, not, Jackie's actually dyslexic, so he shouldn't really be able to write that well. And his, his Jackie Stewart signature is just one of the best signatures, I think, ever in Formula One history because it, it's his name, but written beautifully, like almost like a calligraphy. It, it's just incredible. And every time he writes it, it's the same. It's never changed since since the 60s oh, or 70s. Wow. And when you see it, you cannot believe how good it is. So normally now it's just LS or KR or, you know, it's it's literally abbreviation of their, of their signatures. Jackie, still full Jackie Stewart and with a little squiggle at the bottom. And that, for me, gives him legendary status. But also the fact he's still in the sport. You know, he, he obviously had his own Formula One team. I worked with, with Paul Stewart. His son is very similar age to me and Mark Stewart. So... Um, I followed their careers. We worked for them in with Paul Stewart Racing, in Formula Ford, Formula Vauxhall Lotus, Formula Three, then Formula Three Thousand. Then Jackie got his team, and then we were uh, Jackie contacted us to be his team photographers at Stewart Race, Stewart Grand Prix. So it was great to be involved all the way through that career. And actually, I went back to the 20th anniversary event at his house um, about five years ago. I think it was about five or six years ago. And that was just amazing to see his house and his car collection. And no, it's... he's there with all the Stuart mechanics, all the Stuart mechanics and engineers and drivers that have been through his staircase, you know, was there. And Jackie gave us um, some great memories and it was just an amazing. And he's, he's still, he's... The Formula One, you know, he's, his wife now is sadly suffering from dementia and he's got this great charity, Race for Dementia, which is trying to bring a cure for dementia. And I'm, I'm pushing that, with my charity projects into his um so all the pictures i create will go to jackie's charity to, to try and raise more money so that's a great way to be involved as well and jackie's always there will always he's a real gentleman he'll always say hello mark how, how are you doing how's things how's how's your family you know it's he's truly like incredible that. he's truly yeah. incredible i have a couple of statements and there's a question at the end of this go on far away Flagman in the middle of the track. James Hunt was without a doubt the most interesting personality that that, that racing has ever seen. Cars bursting, bursting into flames, sex, drugs, and camaraderie between the drivers. And here we are in 2020. <clears throat> yeah. There is an evolution here. Mm -hmm. This was the past. Yeah, there yeah. are good things and there are bad things. Sure, what sure. is good? What is bad for I you mean, personally? I mean... We were so lucky to get involved. Obviously, Sutton's as a company started in 1980. I joined 85. It became a huge business. But around the, the, the sort of middle of the 90s, 95, 96, we got to work with um, a photography called, uh, photographer called David Phipps. So he was an agency that was based in Norfolk, worked for Lotus. Um, he was a really, had a really good archive. And, and we worked on a 50-50. So we'd get the originals duplicate them and, and then try and distribute them and make him some money and then about three or four years later he said look you're doing a great job i'm making some great revenue but i've really had enough of being a photographer and my agency so would you want to buy it and we made him an offer we brought that into 
350,000 pictures of his archive into archive. And that gave us 1960, 60 to 85. So I started in 85. So it overlapped really well. And um, the memories that you're talking about, obviously, the Jackie Stewart photo, which was in his archive, not my picture, but there are some incredible photos in there of, of Moss and Stewart and Hunt, the one in particular. I know he's got it's in the film. If you watch right. the if you watch the Hunt and Louder film, um, there's a moment where Teddy Mayer gives the three fingers to Jackie to say, sorry, to, <laughs> to James Hunt to say he's won the world championship because all he had to do was get third place. Yep. And David Phipps has that picture. That picture is iconic. There's nobody else has that photo. And the only reason it can be in the film is because of David Phipps' picture. So you think about photographs tell a story and the moments in history and they record a moment in history. That, that's, again, what it's all about. And then there's the one of, the, the really famous one of, of James where he sat on the car. And he's Smoking lit- with a girl. Yeah, with a girl and the beer. I mean, there's no more, <laughs> there's no more iconic photos from that era or, or of James Hunt to say he's the, the ultimate playboy, you know. Um, it, it's an incredible photo. But those, those, those times was, were very different. There was no computers. It was more about the driver. Um, yeah. And it really was fat tires, big engine, you know, uh, obviously normally aspirated V8s that, that Cosworth produced. Mainly. People were people were dying left and right also. Yeah, I mean, it's I tragic mean, how many people died. I mean, obviously, um, when you look at why Jackie Stewart retired, you know, the reason he retired is because he saw so many of his friends die, you know, and he just God. thought, having won that third title, it's time for me to, to hand up, you know, give, my, give, give someone else a chance. But obviously he then was instrumental in bringing safety to the sport. And yes. whether, whether it was whether it was more marshals or, you know, they didn't even have fire extinguishers around a lot of the tracks, you know, and the barriers were in the wrong place and things like this, you know, and they, they started to have the driver's meetings, which they still have now, you know, the G, GPDA is, is still there in Formula One and they, they're always looking to, to improve safety and that's, that's the key part. And obviously I was there in 94 when, when Senna tragically died and that was, that was the beginning of the, the next generation, as you could say, of, of, of improvements in safety. After after Senna died, I'm, Ro- I'm Roland Ratzenberger. Who was I mean, a, who was a, you, you there's there's a, there, there's I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about yeah. Senna because I mean like it, it is yeah. like for me personally, uh, obviously I'm I'm I, this is the first driver that I actually, you know like I was watching him, sure. you know and and I, I was you know I, I saw that that crash on the on the on the television. But for you, the connection is really really interesting. Your father takes. Uh, photographs of him in 81 he's driving a formula ford 1600 uh, there's a bunch of photographs next to him in right. his early days in yeah, 94 yeah. you were you were next to him when, when when he's announced as a williams driver and then 94 you had ayrton senna michael schumacher getting out of that famous briefing yeah yeah i know yeah, and yeah. then there are photographs of you placing the flowers on his grave uh, uh there's crazy. that connection what was he like what, what was he like what, i mean this is a this is a mountain of man yeah it, it, i was there in 81 obviously i went as a little 16 year old boy and didn't really know what no. center was it's this great picture of me in the background of the shop while he's looking at the car and looking you, you can see then that he's totally in, in 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 enhanced or no it's not the word totally focused on improving that car even then in formula ford and there wasn't, wasn't much you could do because there's no wings it's all about really it's all about the driving skill but obviously you can change the, the suspension and, and 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 adjust that slightly but there's not much you can do but he was really in i was watching him even then in 81 you know how, how involved he was talking to his uh puddy his race engineer back in then in formula ford who who then became actually um jensen's engineer which is the great link Jensen's engineer in Formula Ford was Puddy as well, who's Senna's engineer, which was incredible. Oh, wow. Because he was Van Diemen. Uh, but, yes, yeah, Senna was amazing. And, obviously, yeah, to watch him in Formula 3, I didn't really do anything in Formula Ford 2000. But, yeah, Formula 3, obviously the crash, obviously the party, the winning the championship, and then, obviously, the the tests. And, and obviously, when I went to the first Grand Prix in 84, he was there on the podium, uh, which was incredible. His first podium, uh, that was incredible. Um, I think Nicky Lauda won that race. I think he did. I think all across the continent. But anyway, um, and then obviously my, my paths didn't really follow Senna so much. I, I only did a few Grand Prix in, in the early 80s, but obviously my break came in 92. But I still followed him because obviously my brother was taking the pictures. I was oh, sure, watching, but... I was I was really intense. I was, And every Grand Prix I went to, 
whether it was, you know, doing but all did the you, did, you, did you have a relationship with Senna? I mean, like, you know, was it friendly uh, or, or not really? I remember 93 in particular, <laughs> um, going to get some things, again, for charity. I got Senna, Prost, Mansell and um, Hill mm-hmm. all at that race, one picture. And it was quite funny because I went to the charity ball it, that it happened with, and one guy bought all four of them and they're probably worth a fortune now. But I remember going to get the Senna one in the garage. I literally, in those days you could just walk in, you know. Um, I mean, literally no one really cared in those days. No, re- There were still the barriers, but no one, they weren't as secure as they are now. There was no security. And uh, Senna, I said to Senna, I said, I'm doing this thing for charity and I just need this one signature out and w- would you mind doing it? And he said, yeah, whatever you want. Yeah, I think he said Mark, but because I didn't really have that relationship with him then. But obviously in, in 94, um, I didn't take the picture, but there's one particular, we were talking about it the other day, the photo- I'm with the photographer who took this shot. He worked for Sutton's, um, he's called Charles Coates and he's got a really tall guy. He's called mm-hmm. Tutor. And um, he he took this amazing shot and sent a second lap in the Williams. When he came, he saw him come down the first lap and it was this massive explosion out the back of the car because they'd set the car too low. And he thought, I need to get something of Senna on the track. It was really dark and he was shooting in film. So he went on the pit wall and shot it an eighth of a second. <laughs> and he's got this massive spark out the back. It's an incredible picture. And um, Tutor too then got went to the Williams. He actually went to the Williams factory. No one wanted to go, but... Um, he went to the Williams factory with Senna's tour. I mean, it, he talked about it the other day. He said, it's an incredible thing to think. I went and, and Senna went and met all the mechanics. So it's before Imola. And then I went to the Imola test. Um, so obviously Senna was there, had loads of problems, broke down a couple of times. I got a great yeah. shot of the truck coming back on the truck with him sat on the, ca- on the, on the, on the truck itself with the car in the background, beautiful pictures. Um, and then I was looking, I, t- I took a couple of prints I think I took one print and I gave it to Anne Bradshaw, who's the press officer for Williams, who we'd known for years. And she said, I said, can you get it signed by Ayrton? He said, yeah, I'll get it done for you. So I have that in my treasure of of memorabilia. That's a memory I'll never forget. And obviously then about a month later, I did I did the race. And then over that weekend, I could I knew Senna was under pressure. I knew. Obviously, there's the tragic events of, of, first of all, of Rubens with the crash. I, I wasn't there for that. And obviously, then the Roland. We, I worked with Roland. I mean, the other, the other spooky thing was that I found Roland Ratzenberger's business card from when he lived in he lived in Blakesley. He lived near Toaster, where, where we are our office. I found his business card the other day. And that was just bizarre. And I'm, I've been in touch with... Um, a guy who's trying to produce a Roland Ratzenberger film at the moment with the family and with all. Yeah. yeah. And and that's ongoing. And I, and I said to him, I've just found his card in, in a mix of cards of about that many. And that's just bizarre as well. Anyway, Roland tragic. I, he was a great friend and I, that was a tragic day. We worked for Simtech as well. So we were following the Simtech team as well as following the Williams team. We were working for Williams. Yeah. So the whole week and we were working for Jordan. This is the other thing. If you think about it, we're working for Jordan. Then Rubens has his crash. We're working for Simtech, and then Roland has his tragic accident, and then we're working for Williams. And then, so it, it, it's incredible that weekend. Um, I'll never forget it for the rest of yeah, my life. And sure. obviously, I was on the next corner. I was on Toza. But the, the living memory that I will always forget is that when Senna, I didn't know where Senna was. He was round the corner at Tambor, Tamborella, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. so it was yeah, the yeah. second before. I was at Toza where they come in and they, they come normally like two abreast into the corner, and you've got a massive bank of people on the right. To Fozies, just tens of thousands. And actually, when I look back at those pictures, they're on the fence. All the Tafosi is actually standing and sitting on, on the fence, going down the corner. I've got the rear shot with the safety car. So before Senna's crash, I've got the rear shot with the safety car. And they're all climbing on the fence already. T- the crowd there must have been like 130,000. Obviously, they have the crash. And then my living memory was the helicopter landing to pick Senna up and take him to hospital. But yeah, when the helicopter yeah. took off, I didn't know what was happening. There was no, it was all in Italian. There was no English translation in those days, even in 94. And I didn't know what was happening really. And some people, some of the photographers went off and went to get pictures of whatever it was. I didn't know what it was. And they obviously got pictures of Senna's car on the track or whatever they did. I mean, I wouldn't really, we weren't really a news agency as that at that point. We were working for Williams. So we didn't really want to get those shots. So I just stayed where I was. But my living memory was when the helicopter took off. The Tifosi, all of them just clapped. 
They never they never cheered. They just all clapped as the helicopter took off, and it was eerie. And you can see it on the film. You can't hear the crowd, but I I remember it in yeah. my mind. And as he took off, it was just a sea of clapping as the helicopter goes away. And obviously in the film, you see that helicopter going away. And that that sticks in my mind forever. And obviously I know you're talking about the shot from 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 uh, the driver's briefing was on the Sunday, which is yeah unusual. yeah yeah. I mean because the moment uh, crash and the accident and the tragedy of, of that, they delayed it till Sunday morning. So I followed Senna and he, he signed a few autographs with, he's talking to Berger and then he came out with Michael, but he didn't go down the paddock. He went down the pit lane mm -hmm. and I followed him from behind and you've got that eerie photo where they don't look like they want to race. It really looks in that picture to me like Senna didn't want to race at all. He and he didn't. Even, even, Michael, even Michael looks like he's, you know, he's distraught really. And I, I think because of those events, they shouldn't have raced personally, but anyway, they did race. Yeah, it was I all mean, TV and I mean, money. It's... It's, yeah. it's, it's, it is, yeah. it is what it is. I have two more it's questions. Like, as far have, as I'm concerned, Senna, yeah. Senna for me, probably my favorite driver, not only for driving, but I, I remember listening to him in the press conferences. <laughs> I remember the press conference from Adelaide 93 and he, he always thought so much about what he was going to say. He never said anything wrong. And he, he, he was very, very much like a, the brain was ticking all the time on, on what he was going to answer back to, to, to uh, Joe Sayward or there was one particular Australian journalist. He was quite, he always asked him interesting questions, but quite evasive questions. And Senna loved to reply to him, you know, with, with a really sn snidey comment, but it was so interesting listening to him. It was, for me, it was, it was a legend. It was amazing. In, in the replies, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was amazing to me that I've got, I've got somebody at the door. Oh, One please, please, no, please, please answer, answer, answer the door. Uh, no, no problem. Come back later. I think it's the cleaner. Cause I've been oh, no, it's, it's all right. It's like, it's water, I, I have two more questions and, 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 and we're done. Uh, yeah, okay. Number one, 1992 Brazilian Grand Prix, Giovanna Amati. The last, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead, please, please answer. Supplies have arrived. The lockdown supplies. Oh my god, I mean like you're saved. Or they could be or they could be these lockdown supplies. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. I, I I have those supplies too. <laughs> Between the two, we can go wine or wine or water. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 just about time for my supplies to kind of like kick in. I, I'm living in Bali, you know, so, so it's like it's 7 p.m. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to ask you about Giovanna Amati, last woman uh, who drove in Formula One. And I actually like I really like the fact that you have that on, on, on your Instagram. Why there is no female drivers in Formula One? Uh, is it uh, just the strength? Yeah, I mean, we had obviously... Um, I can't remember her first name. Savasta. She, she was the one the Brazilian, driving. For, yeah. um, the Brazilian one driving for uh, mm -hmm. Mana. Was she was she Spanish? I think she was Spanish. I'm not hundred percent sure. I, like I, I, I heard that yeah. the, the name yeah. sounds I mean, familiar. I mean, we want more equality. I mean, uh, things about equality. We're talking about the the end racism thing, and I think equality in Formula One needs to come more. We've we've got we don't have enough engineers. Um, we don't have enough mechanics. We don't have enough equality in formula one i think that's uh, something that needs to be addressed and it will be by formula one and, and the teams i know there's more i see more women actually within within the sport for sure and obviously catering and things like that but that that shouldn't be that way it tends to be that the press offices are more women but uh, it should be equal either way you know but i agree about the obviously we've got this formula formula w series and that's a way of the fi trying to bring women to formula one Mm. Obviously, it's not doing that at the moment. I, I think you need to. They need to drive equally, under the same terms. You know. It, oh no, no! I mean, you got to be the best. You know, because like, if you come to Formula One, you're going to have to drive against them anyway. So, oh, I think really, it's it's a difficult thing to keep everyone happy. Obviously, it's great to bring women into motorsport, and I, I, we're all for it. And the W Series is going to do something to bring them there. But they are they are going to have to compete against men at the end of the day if they oh, want to go to 100%, 100%. whether they go to formula two or formula three you know 
I mean, I watched the Formula Three race. Um, yes, uh, sorry, on on Sunday, it was an amazing race. That was just spectacular. And all the marshals came out and clapped them because it was such a great race. The Formula Two race was a bit boring, but the Formula Three race, it was almost like the one, you know, Motor Three. You know, the Motor Three races where they're all they're in that down the straight, you know, ten in a line. It's like that. I mean, Formula Three was incredible. So I th- I think. The W Series is great, but they do need to entwine into the into the what is. I know it's a men's sport at the moment, but oh, sure. we need we just need to get maybe, maybe what they could have is a women's team there. So they could have a you know they could have a team of three drivers that that is only women, but obviously you, you still need to have the mix of mechanics and engineers. You know, no, no, of course, of course. I mean, like uh, it just. I mean, I, I, I was thinking like, what is it? Is it, is it just the strength and 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 the and the and, But I don't think that the, the, this is the reason. Yeah, I think it is a strength thing. I, I think, obviously, whether whether men are equal to women in terms of the bulk of the weight, I don't know. I, I, I don't compare. Well, we, we're definitely undeniably stronger. I mean, the, the, the Lewis, that's that's just you know like. Yeah, I mean, when you look at Lewis, he has bulked up over the over the winter oh. period, or certainly the lockdown period, and he's much more muscular, musclier. Um, mm-hmm. When you see that T-shirt on the end, races and T-shirt, he looks really buff you know yeah um, but weight uh, muscle actually is more weight and they don't necessarily want that but he's obviously working it out between between muscle mass and uh, and obviously you know whatever he does well but, the weight counts i mean in formula one definitely the less you weigh the better uh, th- that's for think, sure you know in terms of sponsors obviously you could see sponsors f- from a women's side coming into that formula would be incredible one. yeah so you could see you know, uh, beauty brands coming into Formula One. There's, there's a massive avenue that can come into not only for, sure. for the drivers, but obviously Look, the potential for Formula One itself. You know, so I mean, some it, of the drivers are, are driving because of the marketability. Obviously, yeah. you have to be amazing driver to drive. I mean, like you know, nobody's bad well, driver well, here. Or even wealth. But, you know, I mean, in, in some cases, we've got you know wealthy fathers of, of racing drivers, and they, yes, they, yes, they bought teams. You know, so <laughs> you know, it's not. It's not necessarily. I mean, I mean, I, I personally think it should be talent that, that comes into Formula One, but we can't, we you know, we can't please everybody. And and I'm, I'm afraid to say that the money does talk. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, uh, Lewis was great in Australia when he said cash is king. You know, because obviously we went to Australia and we didn't have the race, but and he said it's more because of, of money. You know, that we went there, <laughs> and it's true. You know, I mean, the reason we're having these races now really is because of money. You know, we've got to keep those sponsors. You know, they paid all their money. Their their brands have got to be seen on TV. The TV companies, obviously, they're they're obviously got to have an avenue to to show the people the races. So they're they're quite happy in in that term. But the potential is there to bring a woman to Formula One. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I I I I would love to see uh, see see a girl kick kick everybody's ass. I mean, that's for sure. We've got an Indian driver now who's I think running in Formula Two. Now he's come from the staircase of karting. He was he was talent spotted through VJ Malia. Did this talent spotted thing from mm-hmm. finding someone in India who's an Indian driver and bringing him a staircase through. So you can see the potential is there, but I think it needs to start more in the grassroots. I think it needs to be in karting. You need to bring equality into through karting there. first, and then bring it through that way. I don't think by having a Formula Formula necessarily a Formula W series is going to bring is going to give you that Formula One driver. It's a great avenue, but they do need to compete. You need to see that driver from from, from karting beating the men. And I think oh, the yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, something you're knocking again. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Laundry, laundry collection. I don't even got a laundry collection. Sorry. Uh, I, I was just thinking the tune, you know, like I, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I'm, I'm gonna keep this in the show and just show the photos. But uh, uh, my last question to you is this: After 30 years, uh, knowledge accumulated, and all that. If you were starting again, if you were starting today, what would you do? As a, as a, <laughs> I think no, I, on that I, I note, so many, I get so many people on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and. I mean, how, how do I how do I become a Formula One? No 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 no. I'm not just talking about how how do I become Formula One driver, and I'm not looking for the answer no, of uh, just keep photographing, go through karting. I'm looking yeah. for something more than than that. What constitutes for like like how crazy you have to be to actually think that you can make it in this in, in this environment? Because now there is such a competition. Uh, I think- 
first of, first of all, you have to have the passion. You have to have an interest in the sport. That. So obviously my, my father taking me to the races gave me that passion, gave me that um, love of the sport. Not, not just Formula One, but motorsport in general. So I, like I said before, I started in 85, but I didn't cover all the Formula One races till 92. So I, I did Formula Ford, Formula Three, British Touring Cars, Le Mans. I, I did Formula 3000. I did all these little formulas, got to know the drivers, built built my reputation, I guess, in the lower formulas, but also had my experience. So like the drivers, like we just said, Formula Ford, going to karting, Formula 4, Formula, Formula 3, Formula 2, Formula 1. It's a very similar pattern, you know, and you do build your speed as a driver, but you also, as a photographer, it's the same thing. The cars are slower, so you learn to shoot the cars. In karting and those lower formulas, you can get to know the drivers. You can literally talk to the drivers. They want to talk to you. They want the publicity. They want to get into Formula One. So you've got you're building that relationship. And if they do become to Formula One, like I know I know quite a few karting photographers who are working with who still are working with the Formula One drivers because they've gone all the way through the staircase, you know. And that is a great way to start. I mean, I'm not even saying you have to go and do motorsport. You could go and do any type of sport. You've got sure. you've got trails going on. You've got motocross. You've got lots of stuff going on. I, I just think you need to shoot almost every day to become a very good photographer. You need to be diverse as well. You need to do different sports to build your career. Y your end goal may be a Formula One photographer, but there's less of us. It's more restricted and it's become tighter. I think it's a lot harder to get to Formula One as a photographer and. Um, the skill level is probably a little bit different now. We, we transmit all the pictures on the back of the camera. I don't do ed hardly any editing afterwards now. It's all remote on the track. So I'll, I'll do the start and I'm quickly looking on the back, bah, 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 picking the pictures and sending them. You know, it, it's a completely different job than the old days. Of like we talked about with the, fo the Formula 3 crack, <laughs> going oh, back to the, processing it, printing it. Oh my God, it, no. You know, it, the, the process is completely different, but... I'm so happy that I went through all that and learned so much. You know, we had a light meter. We used to have a light meter to hold up to the light to get all the reading to put of into course. the camera because there was no auto. It wasn't, there was no autofocus. There was no automatic stuff within the camera. It was all manual, you know, and, and the focusing was manual. So you learn a hell of a lot through that process. But it's, it, it, it's really about the passion in there, um, showing the passion for the sport. And you see that, I think, in people's pictures. You really do. So photographers that are dedicated to one sport, you see the passion of those photographers, whether it's tennis or football or oh, absolutely. whatever. You know, and that's me. You know, for me, I, I want to be taking pictures of the drivers, the, the girlfriends, whatever, um, whatever's going on <coughs> around the track, whether it's the fans or whatever. You know, I want to see that's part for me. That's the passion as well. It's not just the driver or the action. You know, it's everything that goes on at a Grand Prix. And that for me is um, the key part. That is the that is the answer to everything. Passion. Thank you so much for doing this. This was, uh, I mean, absolute privilege for me, and I cannot thank you enough. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, I'll, I'll I'll get I'll get you a beer or something at at, at some <laughs> race. You know, like I mean, I'm living close to Singapore, so who knows? You know, so we oh yeah, that okay, no problem. <laughs> I'm just joking. Done. <laughs> I do love my wines, but um, no, oh, that's I mean, that, that's done. There has to be other passions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks. My pleasure.